I grew up in a small town on the Indiana-Kentucky border. I loved watching the barges go by on the Ohio River, performing in musicals like The Music Man in Oklahoma. It's easy to think of a town like Newburgh, Indiana, when you hear John Mellencamp's songs like Small Town and Jack and Diane. What my community had in rustic charm, it seriously lacked in cultural, ethnic, racial, and religious diversity. So you can imagine what a shock it was to me when I moved to the most diverse neighborhood in the entire world, Queens, New York, <laughs> to be an actor. I mean, on my block, there was a Filipino cell phone store, there was a Greek-owned hardware store, there was an Arab family that owned a Subway sandwich shop, a Croatian nightclub, I had Chinese and Mexican neighbors, and this was just on my block. And for the first time in my life, I felt like a total stranger, until the Filipino guy got me a sweet deal on my cell phone. <laughs> and the Arab, uh, Arab guy put a little bit of extra meat on my sandwich when I wasn't doing so well with auditions. And my Mexican and Chinese neighbors picked up my mail for me when I was gone. And I started to feel like I belonged, you know, like I was a neighbor. And then 9-11 happened. I was coming back from an acting audition that morning, and I caught one of the last trains back from uh, Manhattan. And I got off on the Queensboro Bridge, and I um, watched the towers fall. And, uh, you know, in the days following, um, a lot of tears turned to, uh, turned to anger. And my friends started saying things like, those damn Muslims and we need to kick all immigrants out of this country. They're the problem. Not only did I not really say anything, there was a part of me that felt the same way. And as the subway train started heading back into Manhattan, I got on one of the trains to go to work, a particularly empty train, and I sat close to a Muslim woman who was wearing a traditional headscarf. And I looked down at the empty seat next to me and scrawled, and knife marks were the words, all Muslims must die. Without thinking too much about it, I took my sleeve and I started trying to rub it out and it wasn't coming off, so I tried harder and she caught my eye. And she looked at me with this mix of pain and anger and fear. And I wish I had reached out to her and said something like, you know, this doesn't represent me, and what's your name? Let's, let's talk, let's not make this moment define us. But I didn't, I was too afraid. Now I had been brought up to value the gifts of diversity, but nothing in my childhood had prepared me for a moment like that. And she got off at the next stop. This moment haunted me. So I went someplace I hadn't been in years, to church. And I was reminded of the Good Samaritan story and of the second most important commandment, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And as I started opening up, there was a group from the church that said, you know, you ought to come with us to visit immigrants and asylum seekers in a local nearby detention center. I didn't know what an asylum seeker was or why an immigrant would be detained, but I went with a group from the church, um, and we visited a colorless, windowless, converted airport warehouse that held 300 people from all over the world. Tibetan Buddhist mothers fleeing religious persecution, uh, West African uh, men and women, Muslim fleeing conflict and warfare, Catholic Colombians fleeing guerrilla military activity, a young man from Guatemala who was a high school senior who came here when he was two years old because he didn't have the right immigration, immigration status, was put inside. And the conditions were awful. They were put in prison uniforms. He sat in there for months, sometimes even years, not allowed to smell fresh air once. There was little to no medical or mental health care. It wasn't their language. It wasn't their culture. So what was I, kind of a, a, a vain actor from Newburgh, Indiana, going to be able to offer? And we sat down, and something remarkable happened. 
began to use our hands, maybe use their facial expressions to begin to communicate with one another despite the language barriers. And we drew pictures of our homelands and put them up against the window that separated us. And we slowly but surely began to learn one another's languages to talk about food and soccer. And a lot of times we just sat in silence and used our eyes to express <coughs> despair and hope. And these ended up being some of the most important, deep, meaningful relationships that I've ever had in my life. And I was so inspired by their courage and resilience in the midst of that kind of hell. I quit acting, went to seminary, and today a Christian pastor because of my Tibetan Buddhist, West African Muslim, and Catholic Colombian friends. And I have a new favorite verse in the Bible. It reads, Never neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for in doing so, some have entertained angels unawares. Now, we currently live at the most diverse, populated, and <coughs> interdependent time in human history, in which, to quote Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. And we can choose to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. And Dr. King could have had no idea that we would become so diverse so quickly. At the time that he said those words, only one out of every 20 people was foreign born. Today it's one out of every eight. And this tremendous demographic shift is not only happening in large cities like New York, Chicago, and LA, but increasingly small cities and rural communities like Grand Island, Nebraska, Dayton, Ohio. And if you really want to check the barometer for how America values its immigrant diversity, look to communities in North Carolina. We've had an over 900% increase over the last 20 years in our immigrant population. And right here in Greensboro, we've become one of the most ethnically, culturally, and religiously diverse cities for our size in the entire United States. And these are some photos from our community. And communities like ours have a choice to make. Are we going to fear one another as strangers or embrace one another as neighbors? And how we answer this question is going to have a significant impact on the future of our health and well-being as a community for generations to come. I'm proud to work for an organization called Faith Action International House in downtown, in downtown Greensboro that helps communities answer that question. We assist thousands of new immigrants from all over the world navigate life in a new country. We also educate and connect our diverse community across lines of culture and faith, turning strangers into neighbors. We wanted to make sure that this was not just a slogan or an ideal, so we decided to put together monthly events that brought together our diverse community in Greensboro with no agenda other than to simply talk, listen, share stories, <clears throat> laugh, cry, get to know one another. And the response was tremendous. What we saw were teachers, artists, business professionals, janitors and construction workers, Muslims, Jews, Arabs, Sikhs, Hindus, mothers, fathers, all sharing vulnerably and listening respectfully. And they didn't let the language barrier get in the way. They used their hands, their eyes, and their smiles to suggest a new sense of appreciation and of empathy and understanding. And these relationships, these what you might call unlikely friendships, have had a tremendous impact in our sense of unity here in Greensboro. You may have seen from that first picture, and um, my apologies with, uh, with some of this. Um, you may have seen the first picture 
Um, and you remember last summer that horrible shooting in Wisconsin at the Sikh House of Worship when Sikh communities across the United States were affected and in fear. Well, here in Greensboro, over 100 people from dozens of different cultures and nations came together to say, an attack on you is an affront on all of us. You're not alone in this. And there was a Sikh woman who came up to me at the end of the vigil with tears in her eyes and said, this is the proudest and most connected I've ever felt to my community. And the second picture you saw, uh, a rabbi who discovered that there were undocumented Latino youth in our community that his high school youth group was going to high school with, who didn't have the same opportunity to get a driver's license or the same opportunity to go to college. And so he invited some of those youth to his temple to listen. And those youth were so inspired that they decided to take a trip to Washington to lobby on their new friend's behalf for immigration reform. And these friendships also helped to develop new, innovating initiatives like the Greensboro International Soccer League, where for the first time, I bet you, in human history, the Montagnards, indigenous people of Vietnam, are playing Sudanese, are playing Mexicans, are playing Bhutanese, are playing Liberians. It's a virtual United Nations of soccer, a real World Cup here in Greensboro, in a town that had thought of itself as Mayberry for so long. It's inspiring stuff. It's these kind of examples that really help our community grow in its confidence to feel unified, to feel like we have one another's back. And when we feel that way, there are tremendous economic, social, cultural, and artistic benefits that will benefit our entire community. Last week, I had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. with 15 of my immigrant friends. We took a bus up there to join uh, tens of thousands of immigrants from across the country, hoping for changes in our immigration system. And it was wonderful to see American democracy at its best through their eyes. But it was really the ride home that affected me the most. I, uh, my friend Miguel said, you know, the first time I met you at Faith Action, when you came to the door, I kind of did this. I said, uh, you know, what was up with that? And he said, uh, well, you got to understand in our community, there's a lot of trust issues. I didn't know if it meant you were going to turn me in. And I said, uh, you know, what do you think it's going to take for our communities to really come together, to see not one another as, as strangers, but as, as neighbors? And he didn't lay out some five-point plan <laughs> or some clever quote. He said, let me tell you a story. He said, my family and I took a big risk crossing the desert a, dec a decade ago, only to find ourselves, new culture, different language, in a farming town about 15 miles from here. In Greens near Greensboro. He said in those first few days, there was a knock on the door, and an elderly couple, Caucasian elderly couple, let's call them Jim and Nancy. And he said to me that they had uh, kindness in their eyes, and they extended their hands to say, welcome. So after they were there for a few months, uh, Miguel's nephew started having some trouble in his math and science classes. They didn't know where else to go. And so they knocked on Jim's door. <coughs> Jim opened it and helped Miguel's nephew get through the semester. And a beautiful friendship started to blossom. Jim and Nancy started growing in age. And so Miguel and his family began helping to cut their lawn and helping them clean the house. And recently, Jim's health took a turn for the worse. And he called over Miguel and his brothers and said, I want you to promise me something. That you'll carry my casket when I pass, and you'll take care of my wife. Um, and Miguel and his brothers had the privilege to do just that recently. And they're now, uh, and, he, and he said to me, you know, Nancy's no longer a neighbor. She's a family member. 
If any of you have ever taken a tour of the museum that we're in today, the Greensboro Historical Museum, you'll see a quote at the entrance from O. Henry that says, what would a, a city say if a city could talk? And I'd like to think our city would say that just because we're a diverse city doesn't make us great. It's when we take a risk and go beyond our own comfort zones. It's when we challenge our own prejudices and stereotypes. It's when we as a community beyond, move beyond just tolerance or coexistence to develop deep, meaningful relationships with those different from us that we become great and we begin to unlock the true gifts of our diversity and become the city we're destined to be. Thank you.